talking today we're talking about an object moving through a fluid and we're gonna I want to I want you to understand something that these are um, technically we could call this air resistance or air drag but it's a bigger category of problem anytime you move through a resistance or resistive fluid you have the potential for this kind of problem be aware the way in which they describe the resistive force isn't arbitrary they're gonna talk about lots of different resistive forces the resistive force doesn't have to be proportional to the velocity or the velocity squared. It can be proportional to any weird kind of thing they want to throw at you. Don't be thrown off by it. What they're going to do is they're going to talk, and we're, I'm going to focus on the one we did in class, the coffee filter problem. And <laughs> the idea is that it's traveling through you know, the air, so it's going to be parting the air as it goes down. Because of that, we have gravity pulling it down and some kind of drag or resistive force that acts in the opposite direction of the velocity. I want to say that very, very clearly. This force is not in the opposite direction of gravity. It's in the opposite direction of the velocity. Look, there were people in the room that on this problem where it asked, what was the acceleration at point Q? Most of you were able to say it was downwards, but when you were asked what the net force was at point P, I have people that put this way. I have people to put this way. So they're in the room sitting around you. You get confused. But in this problem, a more interesting characterization of this problem would be that there's weight happening downwards all the time. But there is a drag force that is not only changing in size, but changing in direction all the time. Which is why actual projectiles are not parabolic. Actual projectiles have an otter shape. They tend to be blunted like that because of this force that acts in the opposite direction of the velocity which means this force is always changing direction. Now, that, this is a hard computation. This is what a machine would do. Uh, I wouldn't probably imagine that we could actually put together the trajectory using our rules of physics. I think the math would leave us because the angle is always changing here. So it would be really challenging to find a, a trajectory relationship. I just don't think it's possible. This is coming from a person who has done some tough problems before. I don't think that one's out there. I think that we'd be, you know, computerizing it up and iterating where it's going to be. We're going to stick with the one-dimensional problem for almost all of these. And that's going to be hard enough. But I, I want to emphasize in the qualitative, and I want to make sure you write this down, the drag force opposes velocity. So you can imagine that even in the one-dimensional problem, if you throw a ball upwards, it has two forces acting down, weight and drag, on its way up. But on its way down, it has weight still acting down, but drag acting up. Now, if, if, you, if you're not paying close attention, you'll miss this. It takes things longer to go up than come down. In the real world, it does. Because the net force acting downwards is greater on the way up than the net force acting downwards on the way down. Things don't reach terminal the same way on the way up. In fact, they never reach a terminal velocity on the way up. Because both forces act in the same direction but they do reach a terminal on the way down. This qualitative question is going to be on the AP exam. You need to be able to reason it out because they don't, they're not going to ask it so clear cut like this. So we're going to talk about just dropping the coffee filter though. That's where we'll start, dropping the coffee filter. And for this example, our drag force is going to be proportional to the velocity. I should put a negative sign here and make this a vector equation. But that negative sign is merely to indicate that the force opposes the direction of the velocity. 
Don't be thrown off by it. So if they provide you with an equation that looks like that, that negative sign is directional. Anytime you see a negative sign, check to see if it's on a vector. Because if it is, then it's telling you direction. And a lot of you forget that. So write that down to highlight it, something. If there's a negative sign in an equation, check and see if it's on a vector quantity. So that you understand it, just pointing you in the right direction is helping you. So in this problem, we have two forces that act to provide a combined net force that accelerates our object. Those two forces, if we use downwards as positive, which I would like to do for this problem, are going to be mg and cv, which is going to equal ma. Now, this is where we really diverge from last year. The most common way to answer the following question is to, is to use Newton's laws. The question is going to be this. Write a differential equation for the velocity of the object. You're going to hear that, you're, you're going to hear that on a test somewhere. They might say write but do not solve but they're definitely going to ask you to write a differential equation. And I want you to understand differential equations only come from three places in physics, and one of them we will never see. So there's only two ways for you guys to write a differential equation. Two ways. And the most common way is Newton's second law. Newton's second law is the most common way to write a differential equation. Now... I'm going to hit pause and why. Acceleration is a differential. Acceleration is a differential. It's a differential related to velocity. It's also a differential related to position, but because it's a second derivative, that's less useful to us. There are no tools in your tool bag that will help you with a second differential. You are only going to be successful in problems where you have a first differential. So be aware, the second differential is going to pose big, big troubles. But you should expect that you will have a first differential equation, what's called a first order differential equation. When you're asked to create a differential equation, the way you make a differential equation is to replace a variable with the differential form that matches another variable. That's what creating a differential equation is about. This is method number one. Method number one is to replace a variable with its differential form that matches another variable. Now you have to figure out if there is a differential form that matches another variable. Lucky for us, you only have one set of differentials to worry about. dx dt and dv dt. So if you have an equation with x, see if there's a velocity. If you have a question with v, see if there's an acceleration. That's why Newton's second law is used, because it always has an acceleration built in. Now, the simple act of substitution that, just that, that is creating a differential equation. That's two to three points on the exam, right there. If you can make that substitution and create a new relationship, they'll give you one point for starting here, one point for substituting those in, and one point for doing that. This will be three points wherever it shows up on your exam. I know it doesn't sound like much. This is a simple, low-hanging three points. You get that, right? And it doesn't matter what this is. No, it doesn't matter how complicated the function is. You drop it in there and you replace the acceleration with dv dt. You have now created what's known as a first order differential equation. The order refers to how deep the derivative is. So this is the first derivative, so that's a first order differential equation. By the way, I think some of you already know this, this could also be written as v with a dot on top. It could also be written as 
right? You're doing primes, I think, in your, your calculus class. Dot notation is actually more common than the prime notation. So in engineering, you'll see the dot notation almost all the time. You won't see the prime notation because the prime means something else in engineering and in physics. So this is more common than this. Don't be thrown off. No teacher will explain that to you when you get to college. Now, creating a differential equation usually is its own part of the problem. However, almost always after you create a differential equation, you're going to be asked to solve it. And solving a differential equation isn't getting an answer. Solving a differential equation is getting a relationship. If you have a differential equation and they're asking you to solve it, what they want is they want velocity as a function of the time. That's what they're expecting you to get. They are asking you to derive a motion equation. That's what Newton's laws were destined to do. I told you that they are useful to solve for a force or to solve for a, a, an acceleration. The truth is they're to create a motion equation. That's what we want here. I want the motion equation that describes how the object goes from being at rest to reaching terminal velocity. I want to know what happens because we know the moment the object begins to move, suddenly a force comes out of nowhere to start slowing the object down. And the faster it goes, the less it accelerates. So we need to take this and figure out how to make a, a motion equation from this. The process we're going to use is called splitting the derivative. And it's not hard. It starts with getting the derivative by itself. That's step one. Get the derivative by itself. Can I go to step two? Multiply both sides by the bottom of the derivative. Now, this part's hard. This is the part that students mess up. But you must collect anything related to t onto the side that has t and anything related to v onto the side that has v this might be tough for you take your time done when i say collect all of this has got to be moved over. I can't piecemeal it out. I can't move just the CV over because all of that is times DT. It's, it's a product. So when I say collect, I, am, I have to move everything over to the one side. Now, please understand, this isn't physics, but this is what Newton was getting at. So after you make this replacement here, and after you go over here and split your derivative, you now have this new relationship that you can integrate in order to get your relationship. We have everything on the, so on the side with T is related to T, and everything on the side with V is related to V, which means we can integrate both sides of this. The left side will be a function with T in it. The right side will be a function with V in it, which will mean we are getting V as a function of T. That's how this works. Now, I'm going to stop and hit. That means splitting the derivative. Now, here's the part where Everyone could get to this point, meaning you didn't need any calculus to do that. All you needed was algebra. And the fact that I put the little curly parts on both sides of the equation, that's no big deal to any of you. However, it's at this moment where your BC brethren are in a better position than you are because they've learned something you haven't. You sub. 
it is very likely that you will get to a point where you will need to use U sub to finish your problem. Now, the next portion of this is calculus. It's only calculus. I don't want to get bogged down with it. I do things different than Mr. Brashear and Mr. Bright do. And I know they do things different than each other. When we do this, one of the things that you will be required to do is to sternly consider the limits of your integration. Now, I'm going to say this different. I will refer to the limits of integration as boundary conditions. That's what I will use. That's the phrasing I will use. I don't know what they use in calc, but I'll call them boundary conditions. In calc, when you do this, they generally just do it as an indefinite integral and leave a constant. I know I'm only talking to half of you, but don't worry, I'm about to collect everybody right now. Before you do anything else, you need to think about the starting value for T and the ending value for T and the starting value for V and the ending value for V. Those are what I call boundary conditions. They represent where was the object when we began observing it. Now for almost all of these, it's gonna be simple. The clock started when it was released. So that's zero. And I'm looking for some time in the future. Look, I'm trying to create a relationship between velocity and time. So I want my stopwatch to start at zero and I wanna see where it's gonna be five seconds from now, 10 seconds from now. I want the equation to have T in it. Now, the velocity will be dependent on the problem. Oh God. Well, it'll be dependent on the problem. In this case, we dropped the coffee filter. So what was its velocity at time zero? Zero. And we're looking for some velocity in the future. Just so you know, generally, that's as complicated as it is. Now, this looks tough, but you're just actually looking at one side at a time. So like right now, we've done this one already because we learned this back in August that this is just the number one out front of DT. It's a polynomial. And because it's a polynomial, we can use our polynomial rules to figure out how to deal with this antiderivative. I'm going to assume it's t to the zero power, and I'm going to add one to the t, I'm sorry, to the power, so it's zero plus one, and then I'm going to divide by the new power. That is the antiderivative of dt. Now, I'm going to wrap it in a set of brackets, and I'm going to put these brackets just the way Mr. Bright likes to do it, because it'll make him happy, not that I care if he's happy. His happiness is completely immaterial to me. But I am going to put the limits of integration here. So your step one is to find the antiderivative. Your step two is to write it in such a way that you put brackets on the right side and lift your boundary conditions. Now the last step is to put your boundary conditions in. We put this boundary condition in first and then we subtract this boundary condition from it. So this will be t minus zero. <coughs> All right, that was glacier slow, but I could not be more specific, right? So the left side of this is going to be T. All right, look, the right side's a mess. And you guys who are in AB, this is going to, this is going to be hard on you. I don't care so much. This is where we are. You're going to learn something called U substitution. Why? Because it's easy. We have to make this look like something we can integrate. And we're unlikely to finish today. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to stop trying. U sub requires that we consider something to substitute into this equation 
that will perhaps make it look like something we can integrate. Most of the time, for our class, not the whacked garbage that you see in your calculus class that's trying to confuse you. Our stuff is founded in reality. So almost always, you're just going to drop in everything that's in the denominator for you. Almost always. I would say 99% of the time. Everything that's in the denominator is your u sub, which means off to the side, right? u equals everything in the denominator. Next, take the derivative of both sides with respect to this variable. So I want to take du dv. Well, first, mg has nothing to do with v, so that's zero. <coughs> Cv does have something to do with v, so I have to use my polynomial rule. This is v, I'm sorry, Cv to the one power. So using my rule, I bring the one down and multiply it by C, so it's C times one times V to the 1 minus 1. I know you guys are looking at me like I'm an idiot. Understand that there are people in the room who still struggle with this. This is why I'm going glacier slow. And now I have, and I hope you see it too, negative C is equal to DU DV. Okay? We good so far? Next, solve for dv. Solve for dv. Now, for those of you who really want to understand what we're doing here, we are trying to make this integral look like something we can integrate. So, right now, I'm going to replace mg minus cv with u. I'm going to replace dv with negative du over c. I'm going to, what, who's, there's a negative here, so I just put it right there. I'm going to take all the constants out of the integral. And what I'm left with, hopefully, is something that we can integrate. Now, unfortunately, you AB folks, you can't integrate that because when you add one to that, you get zero, and you can't divide by zero, so that's gonna make you sad. But we'll figure it out on Monday, what we do next.